Uh, good morning, St. Michael's. Uh, my name is Linda Turnbull, and I am serving as your online chaplain today. I will be with you both in um, Zoom and on Facebook. So that's what I'm doing today. Um, there's a warm welcome. I want to give a warm welcome to everybody um, here today, especially if you're visiting for the first time. Uh, we're eager to greet you. We're eager to learn how God is at work in your life. So uh, stay tuned. We'll say more about that later. But for now, uh, as we prepare for worship, um, let's take a deep breath. Rest here in God's presence. Okay, come. Let us worship together. Blessed be God, most holy, glorious, and undivided Trinity. Together, Almighty God, 
To you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may worthily love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, in Christ you have revealed your glory among the nations. Preserve the works of your mercy that your church throughout the world may persevere with steadfast faith in the confession of your name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. A reading from the book of Job. The Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man, I will question you, and you shall declare to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together? and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy. Can you lift up your voice to the clouds so that a flood of waters may cover you? Can you send forth lightnings so that they may go and say to you, here we are? Who has put wisdom in the inward parts or given understanding to the mind? Who has the wisdom to number the clouds? Or who can tilt the water skins of the heavens when the dust runs into a mass and the clods cling together? Can you hunt the prey for the lion or satisfy the appetite of the young lions when they crouch in their dens or lie in wait in their covert? Who provides for the raven its prey when its young ones cry to God and wander about for lack of food? The word of the Lord.
A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Every high priest chosen from among mortals is put in charge of things pertaining to God on their behalf to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is subject to weakness. And because of this, he must offer sacrifice for his own sins as well as for those of the people. And one does not presume to take this honor, but takes it only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also, Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him, having been designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. James and John, the son of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drank? drank? Are you baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, We are able. 
Then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink. But the baptism for which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those whom has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers, Lord, it over them. And their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be a slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. The Gospel of the Lord. Good morning, St. Michael's young people. So we're going to bless our young people as they go into, is it godly play this morning? Yes, to their godly play lesson. So if you would please join me in blessing our young people. Holy God, we bless you and then we ask for your blessing upon this group of young people as they go forth and wonder and learn and teach. Amen. And we may be seated. <clears throat> so if you were educated sometime in the last half century or so, you probably took a class or two where you were graded on your participation, on how often and how well you contributed to class discussion. How many of you scored well on that skill? How many of you dreaded having to contribute? Right, there's more extroverts than introverts here today. Oh, the introverts were too shy to raise their hands, actually. <laughs> well, what I remember most about classes like this, besides the sheer terror I felt, were the people that talked the most. They were the ones who looked at the grading rules and decided, well, I may as well open my mouth all the time, whether I have something to say or not. And so they did. No shame, no embarrassment, just taking up all the airspace while the rest of us quietly fumed. I don't have any feelings about this. <laughs> and I recall one class where we learned the concept of hegemony which was a new word for us, ironically meaning cultural dominance, more or less. And one boy, whom I'll call Joey, because that was his name, <laughs> talked on and on about hegemony. No matter how often and kindly the professor tried to correct him, not hegemony, it's hegemony. Well, I thought he was an idiot, but I also envied Joey, to live without embarrassment like that. Imagine, what a freeing way to live. Well, today's gospel story is for the Joeys among us, because James and John are kind of like the Joeys in the class of the disciples. Jesus has been traveling for some time now with his band of followers, and he's been teaching, but his teachings have started to turn kind of dark 
as he begins to tell them about what is awaiting him. He's said this now uh, several times, and the first time he said, the Son of Man will be betrayed, killed, rise again, Peter, of course, took him aside and argued with him and got a very swift reaction from Jesus. Get behind me, Satan. So even Peter wasn't likely to say anything again. The second time that Jesus told them about this, they just kept quiet, all of them, even though they were all confused. And then Jesus set off toward Jerusalem, toward a place where they were clearly lying in wait for him. It seemed like the last place he should go, and the disciples didn't dare ask a question about this. But on the road to Jerusalem, Jesus tells them for the third time, the Son of Man will be handed over and condemned to death and killed, and then will rise again. So the brothers, James and John, Maybe they weren't like Joey. Maybe they actually had been thinking about this in advance. The part about being betrayed and mocked and killed sounded bad, but Jesus seemed so sure of himself and so set on the road to Jerusalem that they figured he must know what he's doing. It must be something good. And that part about being raised on the third day, that's probably where the glory is going to start. So they had sort of visions in their mind of triumph and fanfare, and they wanted to be part of that. So after this third time of Jesus telling them, they walk up and place their request. It seems perfectly reasonable to them to ask it. Of course, we, the audience to the story, immediately see the problem in what they're asking and think they're idiots. And the other disciples apparently do also. They all get upset about this, although maybe they just wish they'd been the first to say the question. But to be fair, James and John aren't totally out of character for the rest of the disciples. None of them seem like the brightest bulbs, especially in Mark's telling of the story. Peter's already demonstrated several times what it looks like to speak without thinking. So James and John are just acting according to type. They ask Jesus, we want the best places in the kingdom. We want to sit at your right hand and your left hand. And then when he asks them, do you really know what this means? They confidently nod yes. Yes, we can do whatever you do. Of course, Jesus tells them they have no idea what they are talking about, that the suffering will be far greater than they can comprehend. And then he tells everyone listening again that the world's ideas of power don't work in this community that he is creating, that power is completely redefined as self-giving love and service, not dominating over other people in glory. And apparently all the disciples receive this nod and smile and then forget it all over again. Now the whole scene, of course, allows Jesus to offer this teaching to all of us about what leadership should look like in the Christian community, that it should be servant leadership for others, not accumulating power for ourselves. But that's kind of been a theme in the gospel passages these last several weeks. I've talked about it. Others have talked about it. So I'm going to assume you get that. But instead, what I wonder is what Jesus thought of James and John coming to him and asking this audacious question. He does chastise them, but not that harshly, certainly not as harshly as he did with Peter. He says, you don't even know what you're asking. You are ignorant of what you're saying. But then he goes on to say, but yes, you will drink this cup. You will be baptized with this baptism. You will come into a time of suffering and death. He knows that whether or not 
they seem ready right now, the time will come when they will have to stand up as mature adults and they will be ready then. Now he may be frustrated by their slowness and their lack of maturity, but he continues with them in his community, knowing, or at least trusting, that they will come to understand further along the way. It's a little like how he engaged with that rich young man in last week's story, asking about what else I can do to get the glory spot. It's not the right question, but Jesus looks at him and loves him. And that's the same response he gives to James and John. Maybe he knows what it feels like to be them, to struggle with power and not be sure of their status in the group. Maybe he knows what it feels like to want to leave when the going gets tough. The reading from Hebrews that we heard today talks about how Jesus knows what it's like to be human, empathizes with our weakness, having been tested just like us. And because he knows that and has taken that humanness into the heart of God, we are free to approach the throne of grace with boldness. We are able to find mercy and grace when we need it. And that ultimately is what James and John do. They approach Jesus with boldness and they ask the impossible. They have it all wrong, but they're trying to understand. And Jesus, the word of God who is able to judge their thoughts and the intentions of their heart, loves them for their question. It's also there in that story with Job. Today's kind of the finale of the weeks that we've been hearing. All of his friends standing around Job, offering their theology, explaining why this bad stuff happened. None of that satisfies Job. He wants a direct encounter with God. He wants to ask his questions directly. And today we hear the answer from God, which is in some ways no answer at all, no explanation. But God doesn't spend time saying, you're asking the wrong questions. God just shows up and is there in all God's glory, offering real presence when Job is desiring it. God's very self experienced Job's hunger met. The thing is, it's not that we only get to approach God with boldness once we get it all figured out. There's no lightning bolt if we do it wrong. We don't have to have our theology correct. We don't have to have our language right. We don't have to be in a perfect posture. We don't have to be perfect at all for God to want to engage with us. These scriptures today all tell us that we can claim God whether we understand or not. Whether we know God's will completely or just get a little glimmer of what that might be. Whether we even have any experience before that helps us know what we're actually talking about we can come forward and ask audacious questions of God. God knows we don't get it, that we don't really understand, but God wants us to walk along the road as we continue to learn. And I think that's also what God intends for us with others, that Jesus and his followers treat one another with grace and compassion. Rather than being afraid of asking, we're invited to be curious. Rather than judging one another for using the wrong words, we're called to be good listeners, to understand where someone is coming from. It's not that way in our hyper-partisan world these days. There's all these news pieces about 
weddings where we need to ban any talk of politics. Already people are wringing their hands over Thanksgiving dinner after the election. But it's the root of hospitality and generosity that we grow together as the body of Christ, that we give each other the grace to not quite get it and yet to try anyway. I think that's what it looks like to walk with Jesus. We don't fully get it. We don't understand God or each other perfectly, but we keep asking. And God wants us to keep asking directly, not just to think about and talk about God, but to ask our questions of God, to engage and develop relationship to take the risk to be wrong, to be transformed. Jesus kept those disciples with him all the way to the end, as confused and befuddled as they were. And Jesus never trades us in either. We, the confused, misguided mass of humanity, we are the ones that God loves, that Jesus gave himself for. God welcomes all of us, knowing our thoughts and the intentions of our hearts, welcomes us to approach with boldness, with all of our questions and our uncertainties, and to risk traveling together with one another in love. This is what I think being in real community is about. This is how we find grace to help in time of need. And this is how we find the home that we are seeking and make that home for others also. So may we find that grace and receive that mercy this day and in the days to come. Amen. Amen. Please rise in body or in spirit. And join me in the words of the Nicene Creed found in your bulletin. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, True God from true God, begotten and not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary. Amen. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified and is spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
When I say grace, excuse me, when I say God of grace, please respond, hear our prayer. Holy Spirit, enliven the church for its mission, that we may be salt of the earth and light to the world. Breathe fresh life into your people. Give us power to reveal Christ in word and action. Let us pray for the church, for Michael, our presiding bishop, and Sean, our presiding bishop-elect, for Matthew, Alan, and Mary, our bishops, for our partner parish, St. Peter's in Eaton Square, London, and for our friends at St. Luke's Church and School in Martell, Haiti, for the Episcopal Diocese of Jerusalem and Christians living in Palestine. God of grace, hear our prayer. Creator of all, lead us into the ways of justice and peace, that we may respect one another in freedom and truth. Awaken in us a sense of wonder for the earth and all that is in it. Teach us to care creatively for its resources. Let us pray for the world. We pray for this nation and for our presidential candidates. God of grace, hear our prayer. Spirit of truth, inspire with your wisdom those whose decisions affect the lives of others, that all may act with integrity and courage. Give grace to all whose lives are linked with ours. May we serve Christ in one another and love as Christ loves us. Let us pray for our community. We pray for our tenants, including the New York Gilbert and Sullivan players and Unity of New York. God of grace, hear our prayer. God of hope, comfort and restore all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. May they know the power of your healing love. Give comfort to those who mourn and bring them peace in their time of loss. Make us willing agents of your compassion. Strengthen us as we share in making people whole. We pray for Mark and Sarah, Arlo, Aaron, Laura, Russell and family, Chaz and Kendra, Ken and Terry. God of grace, hear our prayer. God, into your hands we commend those who have died including Tish Webster. May their example inspire and encourage us. God of grace, hear our prayer. Gracious God, grant that your people may have in them the same mind that was in Christ Jesus and guide us into harmony of relationship through loving kindness and the wise use of all that you have given. For you are drawing all things into communion with you and with each other by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins unto the Lord our God. Most merciful God,
Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of Christ be always with you. As we continue our stewardship season, we have today um, our stewardship testimony offered by Mariana Breland. Good morning, St. Michael's. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Mariana Breland Hoff, just haven't legally gotten there yet, and I am a new wife to Brian Hoff and a new member of St. Michael's. I am a Mississippi transplant that has lived in the city for 11 years. I was raised in the Methodist Church. I went to a fundamentalist kindergarten through 12th grade. And then in New York for 10 years, I went to a Presbyterian church. I am a denominational mutt. <laughs> the only thing that could look calls me to leave the safety of a church that I knew and loved for 10 years would be love itself. And that is what happened when I met Brian in 2021. I visited St. Michael's with Brian a few times while we were dating. So then Brian popped the big question, where would we go to church? <laughs> At first, I was apprehensive. My church of 10 years felt so safe. Nothing to rock the boat there. I knew what was going on. I knew the people. And it was pretty close to what I experienced the rest of my life. But uh, Episcopal, <laughs> I was apprehensive. I mean, it's a pivot. There's choreography. There's kneeling. Uh, I didn't even really know what to call Mother Kate. Pastor, Reverend, Your Honor. But then I thought about the convictions of how I was raised. My dad was Presbyterian. My mom was good old Southern Baptist. And they raised me in the Methodist church, not because they were all about the doctrine, but because of the people. The people made them feel so loved and welcoming. They felt the Holy Spirit. And they asked themselves, does this church love God or do they love doctrine? In my many visits with Brian to St. Michael's, it quickly became apparent to me that this is a church that loves God, and y'all are the hands and feet of God, and this congregation reflects the kingdom of God. We all come from different walks of life, ages, beliefs, identities, and I've always wanted to be in a community that felt like this, but that also meant feeling a little uncomfortable and a little lost. Hearing and reading about all of the things this church does for the community was so inspiring. It didn't feel like an act or just doctrine, but a way of living, a way of serving. So jump to last year when Brian asked the big question, I said, yes, let's just stay at St. Michael's. I can learn choreography. We soon had Mother Julie say hello, and upon knowing us very little, agree to give us pre-marriage counseling. I went from wondering about this church to having, you know, who knows me? How am I going to get to know people? To having someone in a, pa 
a part of leadership at that, say, hey, I would love to get to know you. She gave us a premarital survey, and Brian and I scored the highest compatibility with how we view finances and faith. Not the most romantic aspect, but the most important. <laughs> so it was no surprise that last year, Brian and I both decided to seriously commit ourselves to St. Michael's with a pledge. Making this decision to give to St. Michael's was far easier and took up far less brain bandwidth than planning a wedding. Maybe because we knew that a wedding is just a wedding, but St. Michael's will be a place that help, it builds our marriage. But why I give is because you, the body of St. Michael's, make so many people who feel lost seen. You open your doors on Saturday, you offer date nights to tired parents seeking connection, you hold a street festival to show neighbors you care. You are a church who just doesn't let people know you love God through doctrine, but you also show them you love God. The reality is financial support allows programming and outreach to continue to grow, which is why Brian and I are eager and excited to continue our financial pledge to and for St. Michael's. Thank you. Walk in love as Christ loves us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice for all.
God be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We praise you and we bless you, holy and gracious God, source of life abundant. From before time, you made ready the creation. Your spirit moved over the deep and brought all things into being, sun, moon, and stars, earth, winds, and waters, and every living thing. You made us in your image and taught us to walk in your ways, but we rebelled against you and wandered far away. And yet, as a mother cares for her children, you would not forget us. Time and again, you called us to live in the fullness of your love. And so this day, we join with saints and angels in the chorus of praise that rings through eternity, lifting our voices to magnify you as we sing. and honor and praise to you, holy and living God, to deliver us from the power of sin and death and to reveal the riches of your grace. You looked with favor upon Mary, your willing servant, that she might conceive and bear a son, Jesus, the holy child of God. Living among us, Jesus loved us. He broke bread with outcasts and sinners, healed the sick, and proclaimed good news to the poor. He yearned to draw all the world to himself, yet we were heedless of his call to walk in love. Then the time came for him to complete upon the cross the sacrifice of his life and to be glorified by you. On the night before he died for us, Jesus was at table with his friends. He took bread, gave thanks to you, broke it and gave it to them, and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. As supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine. Again, he gave thanks to you, gave it to them, and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Now gathered at your table, O God of all creation, and remembering Christ crucified and risen, who was and is and is to come, we offer to you our gifts of bread and wine and ourselves a living sacrifice. Pour out your spirit upon these gifts that they may be the body and blood of Christ. Breathe your spirit over the whole earth and make us your new creation, the body of Christ given for the world you have made. In the fullness of time, bring us with St. Michael, St. Jude, and all your saints from every tribe and language and people and nation to feast at the banquet prepared from the foundation of the world. Through Christ, and with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, to you be honor, glory, and praise forever and ever.
This is God's table. We are all invited guests. Wherever you are on your journey, you are welcome here. Come forward to receive these gifts of bread and wine and for healing prayer offered here in our chapel. These are the gifts of God for the people of God.
Please rise in body or in spirit and join me with our post-communion prayer, which is found in your bulletin. Let us pray. Eternal God, you have graciously accepted us as living members of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Savior. Amen. I believe Kate has some announcements. Good morning. What a beautiful day to worship together. A special welcome if you're here today for the first time or first time in a while. We would love to hear more about your story, your journey, and uh, get you on our mailing list and all that kind of thing. You can find out more by using the QR code on the bulletin or, even better, by talking to those of us who will be standing around at the back of the church. Um, there's going to be some coffee hour and conversation time. Um, so I hope you will stick around for a chance to get to know people and hear their stories a little bit. Um, a couple things to note that are in the email that comes out every week. Uh, we have a theater company that's doing a round of performances of the play Fahrenheit 451 um, beginning this week upstairs in the recital hall. The Greenhouse Ensemble will be in um, in in the house, I guess is the right way to say it. Uh, so those performances, tickets are available. Um, they run about $25. Um, if that feels like too much, just have a conversation with one of us and we can figure out a way to make sure you can go. Um, the performances will be Thursday, Friday, Saturday evenings, and also a Saturday matinee. So um, come on and be part of that. It should be a, a really fascinating and timely uh, play. Also, next Sunday, we're going to celebrate our St. Jude's Day Festival, and that means we will be starting our 10 o'clock service at the plaque that honors the spot where St. Jude's Chapel was. That is directly due east if 99th Street was still going through, and instead you will see it in the midst of the Park West Village. We will have folks on hand to direct you, and you can, of course, come to church and wait for us here. But we'll begin the service there, process here, and it'll be a really special day honoring that legacy and looking for ways that we are continuing to address reparations going forward. So I hope you can be part of that Sunday. I will, unfortunately, not be able to be here. My mother-in-law's funeral is happening next Sunday in California. So unfortunately, I will have to be there. But there's a wonderful gang of people that will be making it happen here. So please do come and be part of that celebration. Um, and along those lines, one announcement, one introduction. Uh, the Right Reverend Nettie Rivera, who is formerly Bishop of Olympia and also Eastern Oregon, and most importantly, formerly my rector at St. Aidan's Church in San Francisco, <laughs> Uh, is here with us for this coming month to be with us, to serve on Sundays, to preach, to be part of our community life, and it is such a great gift. Those of you who were here for my installation many years ago might remember she was the preacher on that Sunday. So, Nettie, welcome. Really glad you're here. <laughs> Nettie and Michelle and I are alumni of CDSP, which is the seminary where Wendy is a seminarian. So we have now taken over. Yes! <laughs> All right, I think that's good. Uh, everything else you can read in your uh, email newsletter. There's lots coming up, so do keep your eye on that. Um, and I think we can now stand for our final blessing. Live without fear. Your creator has made you holy, has always protected you, and loves you as a mother. Go in peace to follow the good road, and may God's blessing be upon you always. Amen. Amen.
forth in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah.